This was deep in Comanche territory, where they did not expect to be attacked. What they were looking at was not just a mobile war camp, but a full-scale village with women and children in the way of drying on racks. Going back to our house and towards two hundred thirteen men. Probably now confronting city mobs and dogs. Ford sent his Indian cohort first, the idea being, as he put it, to make the Comanches believe that they had only Indians and bows and arrows to contend against. The ploy apparently worked. The main Comanche chief, the Vishakwasa, Iron Jacket, emerged from the swirling masses of horsemen and rode forward. Iron Jacket was not just a war chief, he was also a great medicine man. Instead of buckskins, he wore iron mail an ancient piece of Spanish armor. He carried a bow and a lance, wore a headdress decorated with feathers and long red flannel streamers, and was elaborately smeared with paint. His horse, according to Ford, was gloriously caparisoned. As he rode forward, he summoned his big magic, walking his horse in a circle, and then expelling his breath with great force. He was said to be able to blow arrows away from their targets. Bullets and arrows were said to bounce off him. Iron Jacket was said to be invincible. And indeed, for a little while, he seemed to be. Rangers and Indians shot at him, to no effect. One participant recalled that pistol rounds would glance off his armor like hail from a tin roof. He circled again and moved forward. But now Ford's Indians, who were armed with six-shooters and Mississippi rifles, found their mark. About six rifle shots rang on the air, broke forth. The chief's horse jumped about six feet straight up and fell. Another barrage followed, and the Comanche medicine man was no more. The effect was predictable and immediate. The Comanches in the main camp made a brief stand and then fled, demoralized by their chief's broken magic. What followed was a running fight that featured rangers and their Indian allies with far superior weapons, oh, picking off Kotsotica riders on the open plain and, and in the wooded river bottom. The battle extended to an area three miles by six miles and soon turned yeah. into a series of single combats <laughs> in which the rangers with hey, reloadable I'm, 45 I'm making a YouTube six video. and breech loading carbines hey. held an no, enormous I'm making a YouTube video, guys. The lance wielding Comanches. The latter hey. did have guns but they were old yeah, single-shot muskets that could be discharged only once. Really? The Indians <laughs> oh my God. Much of their fighting was meant to try to cover the retreat of their women and children. <laughs> women were killed along with the men. Ford makes a point of noting that it was not an easy matter to distinguish Indian warriors from squads, meaning that the Rangers did not knowingly kill women. This was not really true. Women could ride as well as the men, and were extremely adept with a bow. They were often killed as combatants, as would be true a hundred years later in the Vietnam War, and in any case, were always potential combatants. Needless to say, the Tonkawas and Shawnees and other Indians had no such compunctions about no killing women. Plains warfare was a fight to the dead, always. In the running fight, 76 oh Comanches were killed, and many more were wounded. The Rangers suffered only two dead and three wounded. The numbers of dead, friendly Indians were never reported. Now something very strange happened. Another force of Comanches, as large or larger than the first, emerged over the ravines and thicket to confront Ford's men. According to legend, it was commanded by Peter Nokona, but there is no hard evidence for that. What followed was ancient ritual combat of the sort that few white men had ever seen. Comanches in full regalia rode forth individually onto the plain, screaming taunts at the reservation Indians and daring them to come out in single combat. This they did. A scene was now enacted, beggaring description, wrote Ford. It reminded one of the rude and chivalrous days of knight errantry. Shields and lances and bows and headdresses, prancing steeds and many minutiae were not wanting to compile the resemblance. And when the combatants rushed at each other with defiant shouts, nothing save the piercing report of the rifle 
varied the affair from a battlefield of the Middle Ages. Half an hour was spent in this, without much damage to either party. Then the modern era quickly reasserted itself. The Rangers charged, en masse, guns blazing, and the Comanche line soon broke. There was a running fight of some three miles, ending... We gotta make a TT stop, so we'll probably do it at Tractor Supply, so y'all just go ahead and we'll catch up. Yeah, go right. Be behind you, Sean. There was a running fight of some three miles, ending with no casualties on either side. Ford's horses were exhausted. The Comanches hauled themselves off to lick their wounds. The fight was over. Ford's fight became known in Texas history as the Battle of Antelope Hills, and it was famous for several reasons. It reasserted the superiority of Texans against Comanches and underscored the incompetence of the Army and the Indian Office. It sealed Rip Ford's fame and, most important, proved the lesson that Jack Hayes had learned but that had somehow gotten lost over the years. The Comanches, Ford later wrote to Runnels, can be followed, overtaken, and beaten, provided the pursuers will be laborious, vigilant, and are willing to undergo privations. Willing, in short, to behave and fight like the Rangers of the late 1830s and early 1840s. The Battle of Antelope Hills also brought into focus the rather thorny political question of who was better qualified to patrol the borderlands, Federals or Texans. On the floor of the U.S. Senate that year, Sam Houston had risen to say, with withering scorn, that Texas no longer wanted federal troops at all. Give us 1,000 rangers, and we will be responsible for the defense of our frontier. Texas does not want regular troops. Withdraw them, if you please. He was countered by Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, who reminded Houston of the disciplinary problems the Army had experienced with the rangers in the Mexican War. If the general had gone further, he retorted, and said that irregular cavalry, rangers, always produce disturbance in the neighborhood of the camp. He would have said no more than my experience would confirm. But Ford's raid had stung the army deeply. It had suggested, or perhaps proven, that Houston was right. Ford had done what no one in the U.S. Army had ever done, which was to pursue Comanches into their home ranges. Thus was the second cavalry summoned from its labors in Utah to make its own march north of the Red River against the Comanches. The expedition was political from start to finish. Ford's raid had prompted the U.S. Army commander in Texas, the chubby, profane General David Twiggs, to obtain authority directly from Army headquarters at West Point to abandon the passive defense policy the Army had been forced to put up with since 1849. A punitive force was thus organized at Fort Belknap under the command of the dapper, blonde, egotistical Mississippian Earl Van Dorn, who would later find fame as a Confederate Major General. With five companies of troops and 135 friendly Indians, under the command of the wiry, ambitious, 20-year-old college student Saul Ross, they rode north on September 15, 1858. They were tracking Buffalo Hump, the seemingly indestructible Panatica chief who had refused to go on the reservation and now rode with other Comanche bands. Their Wichita scouts soon found a large village of Comanches next to a village of Wichitas. The Indians were completely unaware of the danger. The reason they were unaware of danger is that they had just concluded a treaty with a Captain Prince, the commanding army officer at Fort Arbuckle, which was located just to the east. While the intrepid Van Dorn was at Fort Belknap, making ready to strike the Comanches a death blow, Prince was hobnobbing and making peace with the chiefs of the same band, Buffalo Hump, hair bobbed on one side and over the buttes. Neither Van Dorn nor Prince had any idea what the other was doing. Pleased with what seemed to be at least a temporary peace and freedom from worry about attacks like the one Rip Ford had made, 
The Wichita's and Comanches were feasting, trading, gambling, and generally carrying on. They were completely aware of the approach of the Bluecoats and Friendlies under Van Dorn and Ross. Several reports on their location and strength were given to Hare Bobbed on one side, who considered the matter and confirmed that the white man would never attack them, having just made a treaty with them. The omens were good. They were safe. They went to sleep. At dawn the next morning, Van Dorn's troops attacked the Comanche village with a vengeance. Ross and his reserve Indians had run off the horses, so most of the warriors were forced to fight on foot. It was more of a massacre than a fight. 200 blue-coated troops were in the village, blasting away into the teepees, while the Indians frantically tried, as they always did, to cover the retreat of their families. 70 Indians were killed, untold numbers wounded. Buffalo Hump managed to escape with most of his warriors. The Rangers lost four killed and 12 wounded, including Van Dorn, with an arrow through his navel, and Ross with two bullet wounds. Both men had to stay on the field of battle for five days to recuperate. The army burned 120 teepees, along with all the Comanche ammunition, cooking utensils, clothing, dressed skins, corn, and subsistence stores. Those who escaped had only the clothing on their back, and many were afoot, since the soldiers had captured 300 horses, too. Though what had been perpetrated upon the Comanches amounted to a cruel trick, the army boasted a glorious victory. The Texas press wasn't so sure. One paper expressed the opinion that the effect of what became known as the Battle of the Wichita Village will probably be a cessation of depredations upon the border settlements for a time at least, but insisted that an end of the war should be the blow followed by active, energetic operations. The latter did not happen anytime soon. On November 5, 1858, barely seven weeks later, Saul Ross himself noted that, since the battle, Comanches had stolen more than 100 head of horses from settlements in northern Texas. The violent Indian raids of the fall of 1858, which had set off John Baylor's reservation war, came at least in part in reprisal for Van Dorn's attack. Still, there was a clear meaning in both Ford's and Van Dorn's attacks. They were unambiguously offensive, for one thing. They showed a willingness for the first time to cross the Red River in pursuit of Comanches, and they showed that such tactics could at least kill Indians. Whether they could stop raiding remained to be seen. They also showed that advances in weaponry, especially the six-shooter and the breech-loading carbine, had radically altered the basic balance of power. When 200 men could take on and devastate a Comanche force twice their size, there was a lesson to be learned. Jack Hayes, of course, had demonstrated this in 1844 at Walker's Creek, but nobody remembered. 